in this initial part of the course. Uh, I am discussing the character and limitations and consequences of the default progressive position in the world today. Conventional, institutionally conservative social democracy or social liberalism and what lies beyond it. Uh, my plan for last week's class and for this week's class was to proceed in the following steps. Uh, first, to characterize social democracy, not just on its own terms, but as I said, uh, unsentimentally. Uh, second, to describe what has happened to it. Uh, third, to propose a schematic view of the causes of its evisceration or retreat. And fourth, to outline the shape of the argument about its limitations both the conventional argument that focuses on its deficiencies with regard to both fairness and efficiency, and the uh, absent argument that uh, compares it to a more ambitious agenda of transformation with respect to the method structural change, manifest in institutional innovations, and with respect to the goal, the enhancement of agency, the ideal of greatness of the ordinary man and woman, rather than simply the humanization of the established order. And that's where we left the discussion uh, last week. So in today's class, then, uh, I want to continue uh, the original plan uh, in three steps. The first step is to consider the most notable attempt to modernize conventional social democracy, to address uh, its defects, at least the defects identified by the conventional arguments about fairness and efficiency. Uh, and this modernization of social democracy, then, uh, I want to bring under the heading of the Nordic model. Uh, then in the second step of today's discussion, I propose to focus on the relation of social democracy to its avowed aim, or at least its most significant avowed aim, which is to diminish the inequalities generated in the market economy and to diminish them primarily through compensatory and retrospective redistribution by tax and transfer. That is to say, by progressive taxation and by redistributive social entitlements. So uh, a major theme in my whole argument here with you about this uh, nature and limitation of social <coughs> democracy is the contrast between a position that takes the established structure for granted and a position that seeks to innovate in that structure. And what I want to do then in the second part of today's discussion is to propose some principles that would guide us in thinking about compensatory redistribution through tax and transfer uh, 
when we no longer believe in the sufficiency of compensatory redistribution, that is, thinking of compensatory redistribution by tax and transfer, from the standpoint of a position, the position I'm taking here in these arguments, that affirms the primacy of structural change. And then in the third and most substantial part of the argument, which we will probably not be able to conclude in today's class, uh, I want to address the structural problems that lie beyond the horizon of conventional social democracy and the general character of the institutional alternatives that would be necessary to address them. So this third part of the argument is really an anticipation of the major programmatic themes of the course, and thus a bridge uh, between this discussion of uh, conventional social democracy and what comes later. So that's the plan. Now first then, the Nordic model, the adjustment or modernization of conventional social democracy. The basic idea is to liberalize or flexibilize social democracy. Abandoning its rigidities, its commitment to vested rights, in particular in favor of insiders against outsiders, especially in the labor market. The contrast between a group of relatively privileged, almost tenured workers and everyone else. Uh, so, uh, this project has been articulated uh, most explicitly in some of the northern European countries, especially the Netherlands and the Scandinavian countries, uh, and thus this label, the Nordic model. Uh, but in truth, as my earlier discussion suggested, these initiatives are simply the continuation of what was happening to social democracy before. As I suggested to you in last week's discussion, uh, social democracy has progressively given up its commitment to the protection of insiders against outsiders in the labor market and in other contexts and retreated to what I characterize as the last line of defense, the preservation of a high level of social entitlements paradoxically financed by the indirect and regressive taxation of consumption. So it's not as if the main project of this Nordic model were something entirely new. It's the continuation, it's the deepening, if you like, it's the radicalization of what was already happening to social democracy. Its most characteristic set of initiatives uh, is uh, sometimes labeled flex security. So the basic idea is that the safeguards, uh, the immunities, the social and economic guarantees of the individual worker and citizen, uh, rather than being linked to a particular job, to a particular position in the social division of labor, are universal and portable. And the aim, then, is to show how safeguards against economic insecurity and against extreme inequality, the safeguards against insecurity are also antidotes to the aggravation of inequality, 
can be combined with the economic flexibility required by permanent innovation in the economic order. And thus, this project is the signature initiative of that general program to which I referred in earlier classes of many of the governing elites in the North Atlantic countries today, which is the combination of American-style economic flexibility with European-style social protection. Now, these safeguards against economic insecurity can take three main forms. We can put them on a hierarchy with respect to how radical or innovative they are. The most conventional or accessible form would be uh, social and economic rights that uh, come into play or are exercised in a context of economic insecurity. The example would be unemployment insurance. And on this view of flex security, all of these guarantees against economic insecurity, which also tend to moderate economic inequality, or at least to attenuate the consequences of economic inequality, are detached from the possession of a particular job. They're made universal. The second level of these innovations uh, is then focused on the idea of a minimum guaranteed income, a floor of income that everyone will have, everyone will be guaranteed by the state, independently of the job they have or even if they have any job at all. Uh, now, this second level is, uh, uh, for the most part, the limit of the Nordic model up to now. But there is a third level, which uh, is discussed in uh, academic writings or in political debate, but not yet the object of major experimentation on a large scale. And the third level is that rather than just guaranteeing a minimum universal income, the endowment takes the form of a stake. Uh, a, a set of resources, of, uh, of capital, in particular an equity stake in the productive resources of society that everyone has. So you can think of this as an idea of social inheritance. Instead of a few people from the moneyed classes inheriting from their families, everyone inherits a basic package of resources from the state. And one of the ways in which this idea might be uh, implemented is that there would be some structure of public investment in the production system. And the state would distribute its equity stakes to the citizens. So everyone would have a share in this equity stake of the state in the production system. And the share might, for example, be organized using the vocabulary of Anglo-American law uh, as a trust. That uh, every person born into that country would have early on and on which he or she could draw at turning points in their, in their lives. But you can, you can imagine how this idea of the equity stake could take a number of alternative legal and institutional forms. 
so that then is the characteristic profile of this Nordic model. The focus is on the development of rights or endowments that are universal and portable and detached from jobs and that take one of the three forms that I've just described. And the larger objective is the objective of reconciling a greater economic flexibility and a, therefore openness to innovation with the moderation of both insecurity and inequality in the economy. Now, in the light of the previous discussion regarding the deficiencies of social democracy, uh, you could say that this attempt to modernize social democracy has two main defects or two main limitations. The first is that it says nothing about the structural transformation of the economy and of politics. So in this sense, it continues the spirit of the original social democratic settlement of the mid 20th century, which was to retreat from the attempt to reshape the political and economic institutions. The entire focus is on these endowments or guarantees, but there's no corresponding project about the reshaping of the larger economic and political regime. And I want to argue later in a subsequent stage of this discussion, that that is a fatal limitation because all of the major structural problems of the contemporary societies require innovation in the institutional arrangements of the economy or of politics. The second limitation has to do with the goal rather than with the method. The ambition is limited. The ambition is limited to the moderation of inequality and insecurity. And does not include this larger idea of the enhancement of agency except to the extent that, of course, safeguards against inequality and insecurity contribute to the ability of the individual to act in the midst of innovation surrounding him. But there is no explicit project of the enhancement of agency. If there were an explicit project of the enhancement of agency, of the ability of the individuals, of the individual worker citizen to turn the tables against the context in which he finds himself and to engage in its transformation, the cost of not having a vision of structural alternatives, of alternative institutions, would become more obvious. Now, before I open to discussion of this theme of the Nordic model, let me then, taking this last <coughs> remark as a point of departure, try to place this discussion in a broader context and in a bridge to social and political theory. The question raised uh, in, by the Nordic model is how we should think about the relation between the security of the individual in a haven 
of protected vital interests and immunities, and the plasticity of the surrounding social world. What's the right, right way to think about this relation? So imagine that just as a thought experiment, we place all societies on a spectrum. At one pole of the spectrum, the identity and the security of the individual are entirely engaged in the preservation of a detailed form of collective life. There's no separation of the preservation of the collective life, of the life of the group, from the security of the individual. So that would be a hypothetical scriptural caste system. Now, we know that the actual caste systems that existed in history never conformed to this model. They were more complicated. But the idea of the scriptural caste system is society is divided into a hierarchy that has a cosmological or a sacred base. And what the individual can do in his life depends on his place in this hierarchy. And his whole security is engaged in that. So any transformation of that system is an attack on him. There's no separation of the central interests of the personality from the, the crystallization of this social order. Now then imagine that we move along this spectrum to a situation in which the safeguards of the individual are partly disentangled from the preservation of the social order. So the way in which we, we, we guarantee the, the safeguards of the individual allow large parts of the social order to be reshaped. But the, and we could say, those are the existing societies, the market economies, the imperfect democracies that developed in the Western world over the last two centuries their institutions and their legal orders. But under the current economic and political arrangements, this disentanglement is incomplete. So to some extent still, under the existing systems of private property, under the way of organizing the market economy, under the fragile or flawed democracies that exist, the way in which we guarantee the immunity of the individual is not completely detached from the rigidification of the surrounding social and economic order. We can therefore propose to ourselves the following project. We want a social and economic and political order that has the same relation to the established economic and political arrangements that they have to the scriptural caste system. In other words, we want to move further along the spectrum. Uh, but once you present the problem in that way, at the most general theoretical level, you can see why it is never enough simply to guarantee the endowments or the immunities unless we also have a project for the transformation of the structure of the economic and political institutions. So that's simply a way of placing my remark 
about the limitation of the, pro of the Nordic model in a larger theoretical and programmatic framework. But let me complete that attempt by suggesting how it allows us to think about the whole idea of fundamental human rights. So there's a kinship between this project of guaranteeing the individual certain endowments that are universal and portable without having any program for the transformation of the economic and political structure and the whole character of the discourse of human rights. There's an affinity between these two. They're very closely related. Human rights has been described as the last utopia. And uh, the same groups, uh, the same mentality that is sympathetic to the Nordic model is on the whole sympathetic to this last utopia. Now, how are we to understand, in general, the conception or the program of fundamental human rights? It seems that there, are, that there is, in this conception, a distinction between two main elements. One element is the method or the technique. And the other element is the substantive conception or the goal. So the technique is the technique of taking something out of the agenda of short-term politics. Those basic rights should be made as secure as possible against the storms of politics. Now, one way to do that is by constitutional entrenchment. So to say, the rules that define the fundamental rights can only be changed by some supermajority or qualified majority, by some difficult process of constitutional amendment. So that's the idea of a bill of rights, the rights that are established in the Constitution. But uh, this technique is not the only technique, because in the history of thinking about fundamental rights, the most basic way of taking these endowments out of the agenda of short-term politics has been to imagine that they are in some way sacrosanct, that they are divinely ordained that they're based on some conception of human nature that transcends history. And these are different ways in which we imagine that we can tie our own hands and guard ourselves against the temptation of changing them. So that is, as it were, the instrumental or technical aspect of the idea of human rights. But what is the substantive aspect? So the substantive aspect would be the conception of the enhancement of agency, of protecting the individual in a fashion that empowers him, empowers him to act even while everything is changing around him. So the most powerful individual, the empowered agent, is the agent that does not require the rigidity of the social and economic order in order to be able to act. He thrives and flourishes and, and invents and resists uh, in the midst of the transformation around him. Now, again, I give the, the analogy of human rights understood in this way. 
to the relation of a parent to the child. So the parent says to the child, I love you unconditionally. Not for what you do or for what you have, but for who you are. And my unconditional love for you then gives you a place in the world that nothing can take away. Now, liberated by this unconditional love, go out into the world and raise a storm. This is the fundamental spiritual and psychological connection. That this security would make the individual unafraid, unsubdued, unterrified. Uh, like, the, uh, like the Seraph Abdiel in Paradise Lost. Uh, uh, that that is the interpretation of the discourse of human rights, understood in its most ambitious form. But what happens? What happens in the way in which the discourse of human rights is carried out, just as in the way of, in which the discourse of the Nordic model is carried out, is that we have the part about the guarantee, but we don't have the part about the storm. The storm is not automatic or spontaneous. The storm needs to be organized. What are the conditions for this storm, for this perpetual transformation? That's what we would require, the reorganization of society, of its economic and political institutions. So this is the whole spirit of the hegemonic project of the flexibilization of social democracy as I'm, as I'm interpreting it. It's a continuation of the previous evolution of social democracy, retaining despite its innovations the central characteristic defect. The defect is that on the whole, it continues to take the established institutional structure of society the form of economic and political organization for granted. And once we take it for granted, we've given up the main object in transformative politics, as I next want to demonstrate uh, in the argument about what lies beyond the problems that lie beyond the horizon of historical social democracy. Uh, now, one, one, one final observation. I said last week that the greatest historical achievement of social democracy has been a high level of investment in people and in their capabilities. So in these alternatives that we're going to discuss, the attempt to guarantee universal and portable endowments remains a crucial element. So it's not as if we are denying the significance of these security enhancing entitlements. But I want to argue in our discussions that there is a fundamental difference between a discourse about entitlements, endowments, and guarantees that is a complement to a project of structural transformation and a discourse about endowments, entitlements, and guarantees that is a substitute for a program of structural transformation. That's the question that is then uh, raised by this, by this treatment of the Nordic model. So that's what I wanted to say. Uh, and it's, um, it's a subject of immense consequence because this is the hegemonic project now in the North Atlantic world. And so the question is, what should our attitude to it be? And I'm claiming it's not good enough. It's fundamentally defective. <laughs>
so this is an argument against the hegemonic position as, as, I, as I describe it. What do you think, comments? Yes. So is de facto because the, because the inherently there's no structural transformation of the existing political and economic model? So, so what I'm saying is this, that, that some form of flex security, and I would say the most promising form is the most ambitious of those three forms that I described. That's the best. The equity stakes in the production system the social inheritance. That's better than a universal guaranteed income. Uh, uh, some form of this idea will be indispensable in any progressive alternative. The question is, what is it a part of? Because it's not enough by itself, and it means something different depending on what it's combined with. So uh, in, this, in this argument that I'm making, the, uh, the defect of the, of, the, of the Nordic model is that the flex security is more a substitute for structural transformation than it is a lead into structural transformation. Now, it could be a lead into structural transformation, especially if you take that third form I mentioned of the equity stakes, because uh, the attempt to finance that or to organize it already implies the beginning of a reorganization of the economy. Yes? Well, the sovereign wealth fund also, which, which is then yeah. a, 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 a yeah. large vehicle of public investment. Uh, and uh, this is partially controlled then by the people um, yes. by a divestment um, into, uh, uh, when it comes to fossil energy. Yes. So this is a first step that was actually fueled by your first level of social democracy, where you could say this is institutional change. Yes. So that's why I'm wondering why you're drawing the line there. What well, it's not a question of drawing the line because I think that the real things that happen in the world are always ambiguous, right? They have the, the, the potential to be one thing or another always in political life and historical experience. Uh, an initiative all by itself means almost nothing. So its, it's meaning derives from what it's combined with, and above all, what comes next. So the crucial, so to, 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 to ascertain the meaning of a political development, you always have to ask, what's the next step? Because it's the next step that then retrospectively determines the meaning of what happened. So I, 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 this, this isn't an argument against the practical initiatives of flex security. It's an argument about the set of ideas within which these practical arrangements are interpreted. So, uh, and the question is, uh, what project does this belong to? What is the longer term project of which this is a part or a step? Uh, that's the kind of a question. And I do think that it's fair to say that on the whole, uh, in the imagination of the contemporary social democrats, it has, up to now, been more the substitute than the complement to the structural change. And that's why I also tried to relate this to the, rela to the kindred discussion of human rights, because I think it's the same mentality or the same predispositions that are manifest in those two parallel discussions. Just yes. Maybe, maybe push back, just to try it out. Um, yes. So maybe it is important to have a mechanism um, before, uh, and just use this mechanism for good, and then afterwards tell yourself a story about that mechanism. 
what, you, what you're proposing is that you a priori always need a big idea. Maybe sometimes no. the big idea comes after the mechanism. No, of course, of course, of course. Uh, no, it's not the idea that you first have a system and then you execute the system. I don't, I don't believe in that. Uh, I, uh, you know, Friedrich Schlegel said two things are fatal to the mind, to have a system and not to have one. Uh, and, uh, uh, but it's also true that uh, the ideas have to be developed along the way. As there's no practical experience or experiment that has its own intrinsic meaning apart from the context of ideas that it's, that it's a part of. Huh? So I don't think we can have an argument about whether this should be a priori or a, pi a posteriori. The ideas develop cumulatively. But they don't develop easily. And that's the problem that we have all along the way. It's, it's not true that the ideas are an infinitely elastic medium or that we can have them when we want them. Uh, the, the attempt to think structurally about structural alternatives is so against the grain of historical social democracy that we have to struggle for it. Uh, whereas the pietistic or humanizing idea that we, the large alternatives in the world have been discredited, there's a narrowing funnel of real possibilities but let's make them equitable. Let's give them a human face. That's the easier idea, because that seems to converge with the dominant spirit in these, <coughs> in these societies. So I, I don't disagree with you that these practical experiments have a richness of possibility, and that they could be converted or enlisted in the service of a more ambitious project. But I do believe that the dominant ideas in these societies are tilted against that ambition. Uh, and so we, uh, we, we can't expect them to have this larger meaning spontaneously unless we form this project. The project isn't formed as a system or all at once or a priori but it must somehow be formed. And it must be formed in tension with what has been the dominant spirit of historical social democracy. Uh, so I'm not sure in the end whether we disagree. Uh, you, you, you have to tell me. Uh, I struggle with this saying it has to develop at the same time. Uh -huh. saying Maybe it doesn't need to develop at the same time. Maybe it is important to look at the world, see all the projects without an idea at the beginning, take this as a starting point, and develop from those, uh, from those mechanisms then sure. an idea. Because Ideas can develop at any time. But I guess I, it's not that I'm saying it's not a thesis of indispensable simultaneity that I'm proposing. That's not what I meant by saying at the same time. Uh, what I meant is that it's a huge struggle and, and, and you don't get ideas from one day to the next because these ideas are not just the conceits of isolated minds. To be real ideas, they have to live in many minds and to be developed as a collective project. Uh, now, in what space will that be? The, uh, discourse of experts in the contemporary uh, state is informed by the specialized disciplines. The, the, the orthodoxies of the specialized disciplines, like economics and political science and law, are hostile, on the whole, to structural innovation. So it's as if the deck of cards were packed against us. It, it's over-determined in the other direction. Uh, and that makes it a very substantial project against which we have to fortify ourselves somehow. And this then raises the issue, which is implicit in your remark, about the, uh, 
the role of theory and of ambitious ideas. So for the left especially, the role of theory has been to, to support the heroic will against overwhelming odds by claiming that history is on our side. So this is Marxism. So there's a script. It seems that we couldn't possibly win giving the overwhelming odds, but not to worry. Uh, history, will, history will be our friend. So this, among other functions, has had the role of arousing this heroic will of resistance. Unfortunately, at the cost of illusion and self-deception. So then the question is, can we arouse the will to resist, to transform, without depending on these, on these lullabies, on these uh, consoling narratives that we've inherited from the past? And that's very difficult. We, we don't have any previous experience of that. <coughs> uh, so we, we have to develop a, a form of discourse that makes it possible to do that. And very practically for the left in these societies, that serves as a replacement for Marxism. We don't have that. Uh, and and that's, a, that's a formidable uh, difficulty in our circumstance. Yes? Yeah, so I understand that the project is oriented against the hegemony of the dominant social order um, and against the fact that... Well, hegemony of the dominant ideas specifically, okay. right? Because so the, there, there are two issues that are distinct but related. So, so one issue is entitlements mean something different depending on whether they are combined or not with structural change. So taking the example of the human rights discourse, for the most part, these humanizing projects of providing antidotes to insecurity have not been meant to be parallels or complements to some project of structural change. They have mainly functioned in the spirit of, let's make the best of the structure that we have. Huh? It doesn't have to be that way, as we just discussed. But then we come to the other problem, which is the problem of the hegemonic ideas. Uh, it seems that to begin to think in this other way, which should in principle be open to us, uh, all we need is to want to do it. But it's more complicated than that, because all the methods that we have that are provided to us in the policy discourse and economics and law seem to run against that. And rather than being part of the solution, they're part of the problem. Go on. My question is, is our greatest purchase against the, the current ideas and reality of the social and political order today that it has this continued inequality that's been relatively not, I guess, complemented by this entitlement with substitute. No, so now the difficulty is we're sort of going ahead in the argument. So I want to argue that, that the fundamental structural problems of these societies, just taking the North Atlantic countries, which are the home ground of the social democratic settlement, cannot be resolved within the limits of the social democratic compromise. And that the Nordic model modernization of the social democratic compromise all by itself without this missing structural complement is insufficient to solve these structural problems. For example, just to anticipate, the problem of the hierarchical segmentation of the economy, the confinement of the most advanced practice of production to insular vanguards from which the vast majority of workers and firms are excluded. That problem cannot be solved, I want to argue, without institutional innovation. Uh, now, we don't even have the way of thinking about institutional innovation because basically if you, if you simplify radically going back to this discussion of ideas, there, there are two conversations, that, uh, traditional conversations in the world. There's the old conversation that came from Marxism and from the ascendant intellectual traditions of the left that there are these systems. <laughs> 
So there's capitalism, and it can be regulated and humanized and so forth, but it has a predetermined content. And if you're not in that system, then you're in another system. Socialism. Well, socialism doesn't seem to be in the cards, and if it were, it would be too dangerous. So what's left is to humanize the existing world. That's how they think. Huh? Uh, then there's this other conversation of the policy experts of, so, of positive social science, which says, forget about this mystical stuff about structure and structural alternatives. Politics is a bunch of problems, of issues, and of practical solutions to them, and it's unidimensional. There, are no, there, are, there is no structural discontinuity. There are no structural alternatives. All of that was discredited by the calamities of the 20th century. So that's the situation in which we find ourselves. Yes? Absolutely. Would that not the Absolutely. Globally? Um, Why would it increase the inequality globally? Um, well, because of dependency. Um, I think if, it, if the North well, But are you saying that if, if we achieve democratizing structural innovation in the North Atlantic world, that in itself would somehow increase global inequality? That's what I don't understand. Why? Well, so I, I don't see this discussion that we're having as a discussion simply about the North Atlantic world. I see it as a worldwide discussion. So I said that on the very first day of class. I don't believe in local heresies. So the, the dominant position of the contemporary progressives is the orthodoxy is universal and the heresies are local. So they think there's a, there's a universal neoliberal or market orthodoxy, uh, and, and the heresies are the Chinese way, the Brazilian way, or so forth. It's an adaptation of the universal orthodoxy to local circumstances. That's an impossible position, because the, first of all, fundamentally, the, the structural problems of these contemporary societies are very similar. There isn't a radical distinction between the problems of Brazil, China, and the United States. Uh, but second, as a practical matter, I, I want to insist, no universal orthodoxy can be successfully combated by a merely local heresy. So only a universalizing heresy can combat a universal orthodoxy. So I don't see this as a North Atlantic discussion. I see it as a world discussion. And in that sense, I think the way Karl Marx thought or John Stuart Mill thought, the, the, these are not problems of this country or that country. But nevertheless, uh, what I'm trying to do is to contextualize. That is to show how the worldwide discussion is refracted in the discourse and problems of particular parts of the world. And because social democracy, the social democratic settlement, was established in the North Atlantic world. That's the setting in which, for the moment, I'm examining it. But as I said before, I gave the example of Brazil. Uh, the, the, there's only one idea in Brazilian politics, tropical Sweden. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, with, this, with this idea, they don't, they, don't even, they don't really have to fight about the distribution of economic and political power. They can just come at the end and have the epilogue, which is this stuff about entitlements uh, and uh, sugar, sugar the pill of the, economic, of the economic model. So this is a worldwide discussion, as I see it. Yes? Uh, when you read about uh, Sweden, in the end, uh, in the Sweden social democratic uh, movement, there were people like Gunam uh, who wrote about on the welfare state. Most of his writings were, were aimed not to think what we should achieve that is beyond the welfare state. Yes. And, and 
אבל I say, נקודתי, דה פקטו, happen what you are saying. They all are, they didn't make it to happen. They saw another society in front of their eyes. And then I'm trying to ask myself, what is the, the institution transformation? What, what, how can I understand it? And, and I see that every time a social democracy is created, it's created with another set of incentive which is not related to economics. It could be a fight against oppression of another uh, country. It could be because they want uh, uh, to establish a national state. It could be, and every time there, there's something else which comes with the social democracy, and then the innovation comes. This is, this is a, a, a stru structural innovation, what I'm talking about, or it's something else? Well, I'm not sure that, that, that I understand whether, whether we disagree about this or, or what your question is. So I, I, I agree with this, if I understand you, you correctly, that the intentions and the ambitions of the classical social democrats were always more than economic. But still, they're the question of these two limits that I've tried to focus on in the discussion. The limit regarding the method and the limit regarding the goal. So the limit regarding the method is to what extent do we take the institutional arrangements of democratic politics and of the market economy for granted? Uh, and then we take it for granted, and then we attempt to make that order as efficient and <coughs> equitable as possible. Uh, now, uh, my argument, which I, I can't justify yet because we haven't come to the discussion of the structural problems, is that we can't address any of these structural problems within those limits. And the, I, as in the example of whether the new form of production will be insular or inclusive, the hierarchical segmentation of the economy. That, to do that, it's not enough to regulate the market in a certain way and not enough to compensate for the inequalities generated uh, in the market retrospectively through tax and transfer. It's necessary to change the organization of the market, to refound the market. That's a project which, on this view, goes beyond the limits of historical social democracy and even beyond the limits of this Nordic model. So that, that is regarding, that's the limit regarding the method. Then there's the limit regarding the goal or the substantive conception. What is the objective at the end of the day? Is the objective simply to protect people, to diminish inequality, to give them safeguards against economic insecurity, to provide them with a shield. That was not the, the historical objective of the liberals and the leftists in the 19th century. The real objective, the higher ambition, is to make people bigger in, in the form of a shared bigness. Huh? And uh, that's, that's a larger ambition. Now, uh, who knows whether the individuals who were the founders of historical social democracy shared or did not share this larger ambition. Probably you have to say that they were confused, as we all are in, in, in real historical experience. That, because the, the goals and commitments that count are those that are then implemented in some project of institutional and intellectual change. Otherwise, it remains a kind of floating aspiration that's not, that's not anchored in anything. I agree, but what I'm trying to say, my question is, when I look at Gandhi, okay? Gandhi did a, a real transformation in the yes. Indian society, yes. which is not, in which economy was a part of. Yes. It wasn't the main issue. He succeeded in doing it because they had a mission. Their mission was 
kick out the British oppressor. The, in Israel, we succeed in establishing kibbutz and moshav because we have a project of allocating all the Jews from the world into Israel. Yes. It, was, it wasn't only the project of, and we did it with social democracy because you can do it otherwise. You can do it by privatization. We need to invest. Yes. People know to. So I ask, when I talk about transformation, transformation uh, change, if I need a story, if, if I mean by it to have another story which is not only an economical story, not of course. Of course, of course, but there's still the issue. There's still the issue of uh, the scope and content of transformation. So you you gave the example of Gandhi. So politics, when it's most serious, is always both religious and institutional. That is, it it deals with the basic formula of social interaction at the micro level. Huh? So uh, there are two things that you could certainly say about Gandhi's agitation and his purpose. Uh, one is, and they were very closely related to each other. So one is the affirmation of the national idea in a society that's, that's divided. The second is a form of practice as in the dealings with the untouchables that violates the taboos with the intention of enlarging the repertory of legitimate forms of interaction. So these are fundamental transformations. But then there's the question always, well, what comes next? So what then is the economic regime that will reveal the, the meaning of this vindication of the national idea, of this uh, violation of the, ta of, the, of the caste taboos, uh, and that was missing. So that's a, a limitation. That's, that's a defect of the form of agitation. <coughs> yes? I just want to push back a little bit on the point about Gandhi. Gandhi's mission was not to, was not, was not to send uh, past the Britishers. I think that was the method. I think his mission was to liberate, as you said, to create a national, a, a, a national state. And uh, also the liberate the, the untouchable. Yes, but the unity of the nation would be a dead letter rather than something living if it failed to be vindicated at the micro level in the way in which people deal with each other. So that this, this, this enactment of the national idea at the micro level was crucial to the message. Uh, otherwise, the message is just a doctrine which doesn't live in the heart. And so this, this is a fundamental aspect of transformation. I'm, I'm really just uh, acknowledging your point that when there's serious political action, the aim is always more than economic. But you, that doesn't absolve us from asking the question, what is the implication of the message for the organization of politics and of the economy. Because it often happens that those who have these larger ambitions fail <laughs> to translate them into an idea of the transformation either of the economy or of politics. Yes? What you describe as the hegemonic project doesn't yes. seem to me to be the hegemonic project of the United States, whose government feels sort of stuck in this idea of, you know, every individual for him or herself, this notion of personal responsibilization. So in the North Atlantic world, it seems to me that you have the objective in Europe of disabusing the progressives who seem to be getting what they want, 
of this idea that they should want it um, and, and teaching them to want something other than what they're in the yes. process of building. And then in the United States, you have progressives who seem to be kind of begging for scraps in terms of, like they see Europe and they see this is what we, this is what we want and they're getting it yes. and we're not. And, so, and because yes. the United States likes to tick up all the oxygen in the room, it seems like the global conversation about an alternative is between like this kind of like this one power that um, is somehow you know kind of um, embarrassingly behind on the social democratic project and these other powers that are in the process of doing it and that seems to dominate the conversation in a way that yes. is beside the point yes. in terms of what you're saying. So uh, I, I don't know how to respond. The reason is so we can't <laughs> I, we. We have to discuss these agendas in particular contexts. Right? So I've chosen for the <coughs> moment to emphasize the European context simply because it's the historical home ground of conventional social democracy. But the United States is a variation. So I'm teaching another course with, uh, about the United States. Huh? But uh, th this is what I could say. So, the, the situation of the American progressives is they have failed to come up with a sequel to Franklin Roosevelt's project. The New Deal settlement was the American equivalent to the social democratic compromise. They have failed to come up with a successor to that, to that project, and they have gotten themselves into this characteristic position of the progressives all over the world, which is not to have a program. Their program is the program of their conservative adversaries, which they seek to humanize by progressive taxation, by redistributive entitlements, and so forth. They have no program for the economy. In that vacuum of theirs, in that moment of failure, they then pay homage to the European Social Democrats, and they say repeatedly, we wish we were you. Uh, as if European Social Democracy were the solution. Now, I'm saying it's not. So it's, it, it's one self-deception on top of another. So first they fail. Then they think they failed because they haven't become like the Europeans. And in fact, their problems and their failures are much more closely linked, despite these variations, than they seem to be. So each of the, each of the structural problems that I'm going to come to later in, in, this, in this discussion, which keeps expanding, uh, uh, w has an American as well as a European form. I think you'll, you'll, you'll recognize that there's none of these problems that doesn't exist in the United States, and that as in Europe, in the United States would require a structural response, missing in the United States as it is in Europe. Uh, I don't uh, myself agree with the uh, characteristic position of the American progressives that they're somehow much further away from this line of transformation than the Europeans are. They're further away in some respects and less far away in other respects. They have some advantages that the Europeans lack. And so I don't think that we can place them on a simple hierarchy of uh, relative distance from an escape to the structural alternatives. Yes. Um, was it here? I just had a really quick question. Yes. And this is more of a broad. Do you think structurally the fact that the U.S. is lagging so far behind the American model vis-a-vis -vis the European model, which is entrenched in this third category? Of but I don't believe that. You just said that, well, and that seems to be a widely <laughs> shared, a, a, a widely is, shared view. Yes. Do you think it's easier? I, in, in general, I, I'm, I, I'm skeptical of this, this kind of view that there are certain classes or certain societies mm 
which are somehow the natural home ground of the next evolution in history. You know this was the big thing in 19th century social theory. They placed their bets on this country or that country as the vanguard of the revolution. Almost 100% of the time they were wrong. And so it's, it's, uh, it, it, thing, things don't happen that way. And, and, and the, these, these transformative possibilities can arise almost anywhere. Yes? Uh, one final question from my side is, for any practical change to happen in our transformative project, do we still need to have a relationship or accomplice with the current hegemonic system? And what I mean by this is back to the point of Gandhi. He, perhaps, I think in my mind, was the most transformational political leader because he thought of envisioning India's economy as completely cut off from the whole world, right? Like an interior continent, which would just be domestic goods and services. And that really runs yeah. against things Correct, like correct, correct. correct. So, so I should, so you're, you're, you're absolutely right. So I, I misspoke because I said he didn't have a, an economic program. I should have said he had an economic program that no one could take seriously, which is more or less the same thing as not having an economic program, which was an idea of regressive economic self-sufficiency. Uh, uh, but this uh, willful archaism was, in a way, an escape from engagement with the attempt to develop real structural alternatives. So I, I, I indeed do not take it seriously and see it as a placeholder for a missing structural program. Now, let me go on to the next step of the discussion. Um, Very quick follow-up. Yes. Sorry, um, you had mentioned that American progressives are in some ways closer than they think to this non-ideal ideal yes. social democracy. What are some of the ways in which they're closer than they think? I think that there are many resources in, in American history, in American historical experience, uh, for an alternative. So I, I mentioned briefly in passing in the first day of class, and we've been discussing this more extensively in the other course about the United States. So in the, in, the, in the first half of the 19th century in the United States, uh, what built the country was the combination of a project of national mobilization on top, Hamilton's project, that all the presidents of the United States down through Lincoln uh, followed. Uh, and the selective democratization of the economy in particular sectors down below, especially agriculture and finance, because this was pre-industrial. Uh, they were not regulating the market economy. They were inventing in those particular sectors a kind of market economy that had never existed before. Uh, and this interaction between the movement from on top and the movement from below has never been completely suppressed in the United States. Now, look at, look at this question from another angle, from, from the angle of political culture. Uh, one of the salient characteristics of American culture is its experimentalism. The United States is a country of tinkers. And the central belief is the belief that, that all large problems yield to the accumulation of small solutions deployed by ordinary people. Now, they have a problem, which is they have exempted their institutions from the reach of this experimentalist impulse. And the result is an institutional idolatry, the culmination of which is the cult of the Constitution. But there's a tension which has immense possibilities between the experimentalist impulse and the attempt to exempt the institutions from it. Then to take another example, there's American federalism. So this idea that 
the whole role of the federal system is to serve as a set of laboratories for alternatives, which the conventional form of federalism never correctly enacted, but which is a latent resource for, for experimentalism. So whether you look at history or culture or the institutional arrangements, there are all sorts of features of the American situation which could be enlisted in the service of the construction of an alternative. But then you have to have the idea. And uh, so the, the American progressives, like progressives in most of the world, have focused on the demand side of the economy rather than the supply side. They've abandoned the supply side to the conservatives. and on regulation and compensatory redistribution, rather than on what in fact made the country in an earlier historical period, which was the reorganization, sector by sector, through institutional innovation. So uh, these are all possibilities that could be seized on if there were other ideas and other practices, if there were a different project. So I don't see the United States as having been predestined to the direction that it took. Uh, the American progressives uh, committed a series of mistakes and, and they failed in a series of ways, all of which are corrigible. So that's uh, uh, part of the discussion that we would that we would have now if we gave a different, if, if we focused, as we will at a certain moment in this course, on the American context. So the second part then of the remarks that I had planned for today, of the discussion that I propose, is to focus on this question suggested to us by the discussion of the Nordic model. Of how to think about compensatory redistribution by tax and transfer in the context of a more ambitious program. So it's not as if entitlements or redistribution had no significance, but it has a different significance when you see it as not the whole story, but just part of the story. So, what I want to do now is to organize the discussion by suggesting three principles that would guide our thinking about compensatory redistribution in a structural context. And all of them have, are already implicit in the previous conversation that we were having. So the premise of all of these principles is an initial distinction that I want to make clear. It's the distinction between the original distribution of advantage, and in particular of economic and educational advantage, and the secondary or derivative distribution. So what I mean by the original or fundamental distribution is the distribution of advantage that is shaped by the established institutions, as opposed to the after the fact correction of this distribution through tax and transfer, that is through progressive taxation on the revenue raising side of the budget or redistributive social entitlements on the spending side of the budget. Budget. That's the fundamental distinction I have in mind. So the first principle is that everything that we can do by way of attenuating inequality through corrective or retrospective redistribution is subsidiary to what we can do 
by way of changing the arrangements that shape the original or fundamental distribution. That's the first point. Uh, so to take two problems then that will occupy us uh, later in the discussion and in succeeding weeks. The hierarchical segmentation of the economy with its division between advanced and backward sectors of production and the relation of finance to the real economy. So these are fundamental elements of the economic order that influence very significantly the fundamental distribution of advantage. And the claim made by the first principle is simply that that's much more important in its practical effects over time than anything that we can do by way of correcting the, the original distribution after the fact. Now, let me give you one of the fundamental reasons, just stated intuitively and loosely, for this primacy of structural change over corrective redistribution. The corrective redistribution always involves, to some extent or another, a derangement of the established economic arrangements, incentives, and assumptions. So the market works in a certain way. It produces a certain set of inequalities. And then we come after the fact and try to, <coughs> if not cancel those inequalities, moderate them. Now then we face a characteristic dilemma. The dilemma is that if we radicalize this correction, we begin to disorganize the economy. Because it's as if we were saying the economy in its operation, according to its arrangements, has produced a certain distribution. Now we come after the fact and we say it doesn't count. So we'll make it all different. So it's a trauma to the economic order that begins, begins to undermine the workings of the economic order. So we can't radicalize this corrective redistribution. We have to dose it. And then there's th therefore this, this dilemma that to be effective in the dimension that would be required substantially to moderate inequality, it seems that we have to be radical. But if it's radical, then it begins to disorganize the economy. So what really happens in the world is that it's not radical. It's, it's, it's peripheral. And this tension between the logic of the established economic arrangements and the effort at retrospective moderation is captured in the familiar rhetorical apparatus of the discussions about efficiency and equity. So in this world of institutional conservatism or skepticism, there are no alternatives. The idea is there's a tension between efficiency and equity. What that means is that the economic regime, as it is now constituted, generates certain incentives and consequences uh, in its allocation of resources, which are by definition, if there's no failure of competition, the most efficient allocation of resources. And then there are countervailing considerations of equity. But we can't radicalize the effort at equity because we'll begin to disorganize the economy. So uh, what that rhetorical apparatus means is simply that we have no structural idea about the economy. We think it is what it is. So this is the unthinking preconception of the practical economist. A market is a market, a contract is a contract, and property is property. <laughs> 
The market order has an intrinsic legal and institutional con. 150 years of legal analysis were directed against that idea and demonstrated that the market order has no single natural and necessary legal form. But this analytical achievement of legal thought never fully penetrated the inner sanctum of practical economics because they still think the, the, in the way that the jurists believe themselves to have deconstructed. So now we come to the second principle. Now focus on compensatory redistribution by tax and transfer. So we've affirmed in the first principle that what matters most is, are the arrangements that define the fundamental distribution. But that doesn't mean that there's no role for corrective redistribution. The issue is, how should we think about corrective redistribution and its relation to change in the fundamental distribution? And what matters most with respect to corrective redistribution? Now, I begin then with an enigma that requires elucidation if we are to think correctly about this problem. So here's the enigma which I mentioned in passing in an earlier class. Among the North Atlantic industrial democracies, the United States has generally had the most progressive tax system because of the central role played in the American tax system of the progressive taxation of personal income. The European tax systems are overwhelmingly reliant on the indirect and regressive taxation of consumption. Most often, the indirect and regressive taxation of consumption occurs through the flat rate comprehensive value added tax. But it can also happen, as for example in France, by some complicated set of functional equivalents to the VAT. Now, how are we to understand this enigma? How can it be that the rich industrial democracy that is by far the most unequal, the United States, has on paper the most progressive tax system? <clears throat> and that the relatively more equal European social democracies rely on a regressive form of taxation. So the American progressives, we were just discussing the United States, the, the, the situation of the United States, habitually genuflect to progressive taxation. And I think it's in part as a way of showing whose side they're on even though they know that it has marginal effects, as I'll next describe. So the genuflection to progressive taxation is as if a surrogate for the missing structural program. So the simple explanation of this enigma that I just described seems to be the following. With respect to the budget, on both the revenue raising side and the spending side. What matters most for its overall redistributive effect is not how progressive the tax system is on the revenue raising side. It's simply what the aggregate level of the tax take is and how it is spent. So what happens is that the European social democracies take at least 10% more of GDP in the aggregate tax take than the Americans do, the American state, at all levels of the federal system. And then they spend a large part of this higher tax take redistributively. Now, there's an intrinsic connection 
between their ability to have a larger tax take and their reliance on regressive and indirect taxation of consumption. The VAT is even conceptually the most neutral form of taxation because what it is basically is a mechanism for taking a constant part of each transformation of an input into an output. And therefore, it minimizes any derangement of the established system of relative prices. So what this tax does is to allow the state to take the maximum of revenue with the minimum of economic trauma. So it takes more, and then it spends this money in people, redistributively, and in the greatest historical achievement of social democracy, as I described it, a high investment in people and in their capabilities. And everything that is lost by way of progressivity on the revenue raising side of the budget is then gained in double on the spending side. So then we have the explanation of the paradox that the reliance on regressive taxation then turns out overall in its context to have relatively progressive effects. Well, this is dialectical. It's complicated. And uh, it seems to be in the interest of the political class, at least in the United States, uh, not to enter into these dialectical complications. So they prefer to genuflect to the progressive pieties rather than to produce the redistributive results, which would require them to fiddle with this dialectic of paradoxical consequences and to explain all of this to the people. It's not clear that they themselves understand it, but, but they, would, they would have to understand it, and then they would have to explain it. Uh, uh, now we come to the third principle. This argument at the second level, at the second principle, doesn't mean that there is no legitimate role for redistribution on the revenue-raising side of the budget. Just as the argument that the fundamental distribution is more important than the secondary distribution doesn't mean that there's no role for the secondary distribution. The question is, how then are we to think about the proper objects and instruments of progressive taxation? It seems that there are two, in principle, there are two main objects of progressive taxation. The first and fundamental object is the hierarchy of standards of living. So that's what would matter most for the purposes of progressive taxation. And the second object is the accumulation of economic power, because capital gives power. It's not just a hierarchy of standards of living. Now let's focus on that second target first. The second target is much harder to reach by taxation. Because the only way of reaching it deeply would be through a massive wealth tax, which would begin to derange the established economic order, its assumptions and incentives. The only way in practice to reach it, for the most part, is by the significant but nevertheless still limited means of the taxation of the hereditary transmission of property and its anticipation in the form of gifts inter vivos. So let's put that aside and focus on the other primary target of progressive taxation which is the hierarchy of standards of living. Now, the income tax is a very rough and brute instrument for hitting this target. There is another instrument which hits it directly and transparently. 
and that is a tax on individualized consumption, sometimes called the Caldor tax, because it was theorized by Keynes's disciple, Nicholas Caldor. So it, it, it functions in the following way. You, you have a, uh, a tax that falls on the difference between aggregate income, including not just wages, but returns to capital, and invested saving. So that difference is what the individual spends on himself, and is therefore the hierarchy of standards of living. Uh, and thus, the, the slope of the tax rate can be very steep. So you can imagine it in the following way. At the bottom, the individual pays nothing. Instead of paying, he receives. That's the negative income tax, as the Americans call it, or the minimum guaranteed income. Then at the middle of the hierarchy, there's an increasing rate, an increasing marginal rate. And at the top of the hierarchy, the rate can be any rate you want. It's the, there's no ceiling of 100% as there is in the income tax. Because you can say, beyond a certain level of luxury living, for every dollar that you spend on yourself, you pay four to the state. The top rate is, say, 400%. Uh, there's no technical difficulty in the administration of this tax, as the tax experts have taught us. It has no technical difficulty other than the difficulties intrinsic to the self-administration of the income tax. Uh, it has a, a, a practical advantage, which is all of the income that the individual cannot demonstrate to have been saved and invested counts as if it had been spent. So that's an automatic guarantee against evasion. Uh, so the top marginal rate, I said, has no, no ceiling. It just depends on political power and will. Now, unlike many of the ideas that I discuss here, this idea of the Caldor tax, of the personal expenditure tax, is widely approved by the tax authorities in the world. The experts favor it, favor it. the jurists, the tax lawyers, the economists. It has a broad constituency. It has almost never been implemented in any country in the world. So you would think that if the progressive, the redistributive progressives were serious about compensatory redistribution, this is what they would favor. But for some reason, they don't, against the opinion of their expert advisors. So you can have a structural program, but still have a view of the shape of progressive taxation. It means something different when it's related to the structural program than it would mean if it were a substitute for the missing structural program. These are the three principles. And my reason for proposing them to you for discussion is, is, is to say that it's not true that because you have a structural program, you therefore cannot or should not have a project that, that gives a proper role to compensatory <coughs> redistribution. It has a content. But the content has to be seen in this larger context. Yes? So if there were economists who believe in things like increased wages um, and things like tax rebates, because yes. uh, on the theory that the more money people are spending, the healthier the economy is, the, the Calder tax seems to be 
seems like in practice it would take a lot of money out of circulation. What would those economists say to that? Well, you mean because it's against the teachings of Keynesianism that that, that, that hoarding that mm -hmm. that non-consumption is hoarding and so forth. Uh, I think that for for the for the moneyed classes, uh, there's an intrinsic limit to consumption, right? I mean, this is part of the conservative economic argument in favor of economic inequality. Uh, so I, it it doesn't seem that at least at the top levels, this would have an effect. A, a, on, on consumption one way or the other. For the people who have vast returns, there's no way they can consume. Uh, uh, and uh, it's not going to dissuade them from consuming or lead them to consume more. It's going to have an entirely secondary effect. Uh, So would it lead then to excessive saving? Uh, in an economy like the United States, the saving rate, as you know, is very, very low. And uh, to assess its economic significance, you have to ask, what happens to the saving? That's the real problem. Not whether it's greater or lesser. But it's this separation of finance from the real economy. So if this tax were to have the effect of tending to increase over time the saving level, the crucial economic question would, how would that saving then be mobilized for productive investment? In other words, that the, the structural question then it wouldn't be what Keynes called hoarding. So, and especially for the productive investment that involves the creation of new assets in new ways. That's going to be our discussion about the relation of finance to the real economy. So I think you're, you, you raise an entirely legitimate question, but the answer to it depends on some part of this structural program organizing finance and relating finance to the production system or to the real economy. Yeah. Yes. So if this increases savings or uh, as you then call investment um, by a class of rather rich people, doesn't that even more increase the capital accumulation especially if you have it throughout generations. And if you do this, don't you have then even more power by individuals over entire companies? I, I, I don't think this is, as I argued before, I don't think this is likely to have almost any effect on, in itself or by itself on the consumption habits of very rich people. Because very rich people consume very little anyway as a proportion of uh, of, of their total income. So what happens to the, the control of the productive assets of society is not something that we go, are going to be able to fix by this tool. That requires then these institutional rearrangements of the economy. Is that true though? So if I have a, uh, I'm a company owner, I'm owning BMW. Yes. Um, I, uh, to 100%, I have actually an income by a dividends of, let's say, $2 billion. Yes. If I reinvest this then in my company, then this is technically saving. So that means I'm just building yes, up correct. more and more power in this one correct. company. Correct, correct. And with that, the savings level probably rises even more um, if I have more incentives to uh, do the savings than in this company. Well, isn't that what you want? Reinvestment of savings? So there are, two, there are two different questions. One is the way in which the economic surplus over current consumption is used to <coughs> finance the productive agenda of society. 
The second question is who controls that or who benefits from it, yeah? And that's not something which is determined by this tax. This tax is not a recipe for economic transformation. So that's the whole point of putting this in a hierarchy. It's at the first level of the first principle that we deal with the arrangements of the economy. Then we come to the question of, well, then what matters in the budget as a whole for redistribution? And I say what matters most is the aggregate tax take and how it's spent, not the progressivity on the spending side. At the lowest level of the hierarchy, there's still the question of how we design the tax system on the revenue raising side if we want to use it for supplementary redistributive purposes. And then I'm saying the income tax is a very crude way of doing that because the, the most uh, uh, obvious target for progressive taxation is the hierarchy of standards of living. So we hit that through this tax. We can't hit the problem of economic power or of who, who controls the productive agenda of society. That we have to hit by institutional arrangements. I, there, there's no tax that could adequately hit that other than, as I said, a massive wealth tax that would then begin to destabilize the arrangements of the current economic order. But I think that the whole, the whole tendency of the social democrats is that not having a structural program a program for the reorganization of the economy, they then try to use the instruments of compensatory redistribution as a substitute. So then they expand the license of the tax system as a way of fiddling with the arrangements of the economic order. In, in this respect, I would agree with the conservative economists. It doesn't work, or it works at too high a cost because it, it then produces a series of ad hoc interventions in the economic order. You, you, you begin to cannibalize the existing economic order rather than to create over time an alternative to it. So this is a... Uh, This is an attempt to think about the concern, the overt and explicit concerns of the redistributive social democrats from the structural program. So what I'm saying in effect is this. Um, it's not as if in, in a st having these ambitions of structural change, you have to abdicate a project of compensatory redistribution on either the spending side or the revenue raising side of the budget. You can have ideas about those things and they can be better ideas than the ideas of the institutionally conservative social democrats. So the, the, the claim stated aggressively is that they're confused about the things that matter most to them are compensatory redistribution. And, and part of the source of their confusion is that they're trying to make the instruments of compensatory redistribution do some of the work of the missing structural change. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, Putting aside the merits of these three principles as, as a guide to transformation, what do you think is their practical, is their possible relation to practical politics? So do they seem too complicated to you? Uh, uh, because my, here's my assumption, but I don't know whether my assumption will seem to you realistic. So. I've stated these ideas scholastically. There's a principles, there's a hierarchy of principles because it's a school, because I like to think in this way, theologically, scholastically. But my, my assumption is that any idea that is powerful and true can then be translated 
into a vocabulary that anyone can understand. So it should be possible to explain all of this in a way that is immediately intelligible to everyone. Uh, as opposed to saying that the, the truth is too dangerous or too complicated for it to serve as a guide to practice. So I'm sure that if we put our minds just to this task of persuasion and explanation, <coughs> all of this could be made very simple and intuitively very clear. So it can't be that the complication of it is itself an explanation of its non-adoption, as in the case of the, the Caldor tax, for example. But what do you think? Yes. I think the problem is how simple are the opponent's arguments. So if, even if you can explain this side extremely simple, if whatever the opposing argument is, is made even more palatable, for example, in the issues over climate change, then I think that's where the battle lies. I, I, it's, I have the impression that, that in these, as in many of these debates that I want to have with you, imagining them in the world, my impression, but you, you can see I'm a very hopeful person, is that the only way to, lo to lose these debates is not to have them. And of course, that's what happens in the world. It's not as if this debate takes place and then it's lost. What happens is the debate doesn't take place. And, but I, I, if, if you go through this one by one, uh, I mean, this, going back to the United States, why are they hanging on to this business about progressive taxation? Come, comes election time, the, the Democrats, the progressives in the United States have the same business of featuring in their discourse these, this <coughs> homage to progressive taxation. They know that it has a purely marginal effect. So why are they saying that? Because I think you're right, it's virtue signal. Signaling, signaling who, whose interests they're defending. But of course, this is a frivolous form of political action in which, in which the, the, the discourse is serving as a, as, as a label of, of whose class interest is being served. And it's completely irresponsible, precisely because of its lack of structural content. Well. Uh, we're going much more slowly than I had intended, but, but I, th I, I don't think we should rush because then we're, we're coming in the next class to the heart of w what would be today's discussion, which are these problems that lie beyond the horizon of historical social democracy and are then the bridge to the, to, to the themes that will occupy us for the rest of the semester. You're on the draft. And don't forget the first undergraduate paper assignment that Peter has here. It's, it's also on now on the course website. Hungarian. This guy invented the creative.